Welcome back to the lectures in quantum chemistry and molecular spectroscopy at the introductory level. We have uh, so far looked at in the last couple of lectures the vibrational spectra of simple diatomic molecules and uh, that of polyatomic molecules, small and slightly medium sized polyatomic molecules. We looked at them largely within the approximation of the harmonic oscillator and for polyatomic molecule the equivalent of harmonic oscillators being the normal mode of vibrations. So, you have seen a fair number of normal vibrations in those lectures. In this module which is the last uh, segment of this course on introductory spectroscopy, we shall study elementary aspects again of microwave and rotational spectroscopy that is rotational spectroscopy, but in the region of the electromagnetic spectrum being the microwave region. And again we will restrict ourselves to simple considerations uh, diatomic molecules and now for the time being we will assume that the molecule is rigid that it does not uh, vibrate. We know that that assumption is invalid. However, if you uh, look back on the electromagnetic spectrum, a typical vibrational frequency of a diatomic molecule is at least about 100 to 1000 times more than the rotational frequency of the diatomic molecule rotating in an arbitrary fashion. Therefore, a given rotation takes the amount of time in which the molecule has vibrated hundreds of times. So, when we say a rigid molecule, we shall assume an approximately same average bond distance that happens during all these vibrations, but that will not be noticed in a single rotation. Therefore, rigidity here roughly refers to the average bond distance which does not change by much. And second, if the harmonic amplitudes that is oscillations are of harmonic uh, amplitudes, then the amplitudes of vibration are also very small and therefore, we hope that the bond length changes are so small that we can get away with uh, that approximation namely that the bond distance remains a constant. So, in that sense we shall call this particular segment as rigid diatomic molecules. This is how it should be understood. There is also an equilibrium bond distance for the molecule at 0 Kelvin, but you know even at 0 Kelvin molecules undergo vibration and therefore, there is a 0 point energy associated with it. So, for rotations the approximation is important. Then what do we learn from the microwave spectroscopy of a diatomic molecule? Important properties are for a diatomic molecule the most accurate value for the bond distance between the two atoms say HCl as an example, the R is provided in the gas phase by microwave spectroscopy by the spectrum that you obtain the rotation spectrum that you obtain bond distances are the most important properties uh, that most important of the properties that we can. The other important property is of course, the dipole moment of the molecule. From the intensities of the spectra we can infer the dipole moment and also for polyatomic molecules these are for diatomic and for polyatomic molecules from the spectrum we can basically determine the molecular geometry, the structure at equilibrium. and electric moments such as dipole, dipole moment and then higher order electric moments such as the quadrupole moment. We will not do much about it, but let me mention that there are other higher electric moments in the molecule that can be understood from microwave spectroscopy. Okay. This is a fundamental property that can be obtained uh, from microwave spectroscopy 
therefore, I would say, it, I mean, even for this uh, base level information that you need to do, the spectrum is an extremely important one. Okay. Now, let us go to the process itself. Molecular rotations, when we talk about Usually, we assume point mass, therefore, the approximation is like m 1 as a point, m 2 as another mass point, even though the electronic structure of the diatomic, the atoms has a very specific uh, distribution and so on and therefore, the molecule is not a point mass, but for this process, we assume these to be point masses. Therefore, you can imagine that there is this bond distance or the bond axis and then you have the center mass of the molecule. Again, we assume that the molecule undergoes genuine rotational motion meaning that the molecule does not move away from its uh, position. The mass of the molecule does not move away, therefore, the center mass remains where it is. And we shall consider rotations only about the center mass, about the axis passing through the center mass. There are serious quantum mechanical considerations in assuming that the center mass is fixed in a molecule at a particular point, but I think at this level of introduction when we want to understand the spectrum more quickly we will not worry about such concepts. Assuming that there is the center mass fixed at one position and the molecule does not move, the center mass does not move, we have for a diatomic molecule, this is one axis that passes through the center mass. Then I would uh, assume another perpendicular axis to this, perpendicular to the screen and then Another, the third axis which is uh, mutually perpendicular to both of these is that. Okay. Therefore, we talk about the moments of inertia of the diatomic molecular species with point masses rotating about these three axes. Quite obviously, you can see that the rotation about this axis namely the bond axis the atoms are zero distance from the bond axis. Therefore, please recall the elementary formula for the moment of inertia for such species from the center of mass if the distances are, if this is the center of mass and if this distance is r 1 and this distance is r 2, then you see that the moment of inertia for this molecule is m 1 r 1 square plus m 2 r 2 square. And you can see that the perpendicular distance from the axis happens only for these two axes, the axis which are perpendicular to the bond axis because then the atoms are away and therefore, r 1 and r 2 are non zero only for those two axes and they are identical for both, both of these axes. However, r 1 and r 2 is they are zero for the bond axis therefore, the moment of inertia is 0 about the bond axis. Assuming a finite size and shape for the molecule, the moment of inertia is an extremely small quantity, it is a non-zero quantity, but we will assume that this is 0 and the point mass approximation and the moment of inertia about the other two axis is 1 and the same, it is m 1 r, r 1 square plus m 2 r 2 square. We will see how this can be simplified in a minute, but then with this moment of inertia, you can imagine that the rotational kinetic energy and the rotational angular momentum are related in such a way that the rotational kinetic energy is J. Uh, let us write that as the J B as the axis, one of these perpendicular axis and the moment of inertia about that axis plus J C square about the two, about the other axis 
And since the, both the moments of inertia are the same, let us write this as the total moment of angular momentum squared divided by 2 i, which you can call as a b, as the axis perpendicular to the uh, bond axis. The moment of inertia is at the numerator, therefore, the Hamiltonian, if we have to write, this will be the operator associated with the angular momentum divided by 2 i. Let me remove the subscript b and simply call the moment of inertia i. And i, which is m1 r1 square plus m2 r2 square, can be written as the reduced mass times r square, where the r is the bond distance and the reduced mass mu is m1 m2 by m1 plus m2. Therefore, if we know the molecule, we can calculate the reduced mass and if we know the spectrum of the uh, rotational motion, then from that spectrum, it is possible for us to get the value for the r. Now, this is a quantum mechanical formula that it is the angular momentum square divided by twice the uh, moment of inertia and the solution for this and the solution for this is given by h psi is equal to e psi the Schrodinger equation uh, for the rotational motion. There is no potential energy we, we assume that the molecule in its own thermal uh, surroundings has enough energy to rotate about its own axis it is a free rotation and the vibrational motion is such that the average bond distance is maintained. Therefore, there is only kinetic energy and the psi is the rotational angular uh, eigenfunctions. And from earlier accounts and also through an exact solution, we can find out Hamiltonian as minus h bar square by 2 i times the del square operator for the rotational motion. There are only two directions, x and the two perpendicular directions. And if you write that and this as E psi, then E is obviously del square psi is 2 i E by h bar square with a minus sign psi. And E happens to have the following formula, namely a constant j into j plus 1, where j is the rotational quantum number. We are using the same uh, label for both the operators and the quantum numbers, but you can see that this is a in the notation that is given here. This is without the hat, it is a scalar, it is a number and the rotational quantum number takes the values j is equal to 0, 1, 2, etcetera. Okay. And, uh, the constant b happens to be h by 8 h square by 8 pi squared i. This is not the rotational constant, this is energy unit. This has the energy unit and therefore, the rotational energy we can write with the subscript E j. write this with the subscript E j and that goes as square j square plus j times a constant and this j is a number, quantum number. Okay. And the unit of rotational energy is h square by 8 phi square i, where i is the moment of inertia. Therefore, if we write this E j happens to be h square by 8 pi squared i times j into j plus 1. This is the result from okay. Now, the units of h square by 8 pi squared i, you can easily see that h has the unit of mass 
which usually we write it in terms of kilogram and meter square per second whole square. This is joules okay, divided by I, which is given as m r square or mu r square. So, it is kilogram times meter square and you can see that the cancellation happens such that the dimension of this becomes kilogram meter square per second square and that is the joule, that is the energy. Okay. Therefore, spectroscopists uh, use this, but normally they report the result in a different unit by writing E j now as a b, a true constant, what is called the rotational constant times h c times j into j plus 1 and you can see immediately that b has wave number units. Now, we shall use this b for all our discussions in this and the next lecture. Therefore, if you write this b, it is h square by 8 pi square i times h c and that would be h by 8 pi squared i c such that the E j which is written as h c b j is given in terms of a rotational constant b okay, times h c times j into j plus 1. This is that and you can see that this has 1 by meter as the unit. Therefore, this is a meter inverse or wave number unit. So, therefore, we can simply write B j is B into j into j plus 1 and j is equal to 0, 1, 2, 3, etcetera or allowed quantum numbers. Allowed quantum numbers, okay. okay. Let us look at the picture of what the spectrum looks like. So, you can see the energy levels when j is equal to 0, j into j plus 1 is 0, therefore, the energy is 0. This is of course, multiplied by the h c and the next energy level when j is equal to 1, you can see that j into j plus 1 is 2. Therefore, you have 2 b from this formula, j is equal to 0, 0, e j is 0, j is equal to 1, B J is 2 B, J is equal to 2, B J is 6 B, J is equal to 3, B J is 12 B and so on and that is what you see in this spectrum. This is 2 B, 6 B, 12 B, 20 B and so on. And at the level at which we are operating, we are working namely with the approximation that it is a rigid rotor and the rotations of a diatomic molecule have only one moment of inertia and therefore, therefore one uh, energy E for a given quantum number. You can see that the transitions between the different rotational levels due to the electromagnetic radiation can happen only between levels which are adjacent to each other, they are adjacent nearby energy levels. Therefore, you can see that the transition happens only between 0 to 1 or 1 to 2 or 2 to 3 or 3 to 4. This is in the animation that you can see this uh, in the next picture, first frame, let us play the animation. So, this is the spectral frequency that you observe in the recorded spectrum and you can see the first transition gives you 2 b, the second transition gives you a line at 4 b and the third transition gives you a line at 6 b and so on. 
such that there are lines which are equally spaced and the spacing between the lines is also equal for every pair of adjacent lines and that is given as to be. And therefore, by looking at the rotational spectrum and measuring the spacings between two adjacent lines, we can actually calculate B, we can obtain B and then use this B to calculate the moment of inertia I which is the mu r square and knowing the masses of the molecular species, therefore, we can calculate the bond distance r. Some of these things are there in the lecture notes distributed with you and you can see that for a carbon monoxide example, we have uh, we are able to calculate from the spectrum a frequency of 1.92118 centimeter inverse. Of course, this number particularly I have taken from the most uh, well known uh, undergraduate textbook that all of you are familiar and I have referred to you in the lectures earlier. This is uh, the book by C. N. Banwell. A very, very good reference at the undergraduate level is the book by Professor Banwell and uh, Elaine McCash. It is called Elaine, Elaine McCash Fundamentals of Molecular Spectroscopy. It is a very, very useful book and I would recommend this to everybody who studies a course in elementary spectroscopy. It is a fourth edition is available in India and the authors are Professor C. N. Banwell and Professor E. M. McCash. Okay. This is available in Indian reprints also by the Tata McGraw-Hill Company. It is a low priced edition and contains very, very beautiful description of elementary spectroscopy in all, in all branches, rotational, vibrational, electronic, nuclear, magnetic resonance and all of them. It is so the data that I showed for carbon monoxide is from that book. You can see that the rotational line spacing is 1.92118. What is this? Let us look at the spectrum here in the lecture notes that you have. Yeah, and I have also used another very well known book known as uh, the, uh, I mean with the title Molecular Rotation Spectra by Professor Harold Croto, a Nobel laureate in uh, microwave spectroscopy who is unfortunately no more. And the book by Professor Peter Burnett, The Spectra of Atoms and Molecules. And Peter Burnett's book is something that I use for my regular classes in uh, the master's level in spectroscopy. And I find the description and the problems at the right level for many students to study. And the Professor Peter Burnett is, of course, a professor in, in a Canadian uh, university. He's, he was in the University of Waterloo for many years, and now I believe he is uh, in the University of British Columbia, Vancouver. You can find uh, the very, very elaborate details of microwave spectra in these and other books. Banwell is slightly uh, lower in terms of uh, the content, it is uh, more elementary, but both the books of Croto and Bernard, Peter Bernath are advanced. And you can see a pure rotation spectrum here for example of the hydrogen fluoride molecule, you can see the equally spaced lines. The spacing between any pair of adjacent lines is to be. This is a rotational emission spectrum. And here is the spectrum of carbon monoxide which we are using uh, for calculations. You can see that the spacing between two lines which is 2B is about 3 centimeter, 3.8 centimeter inverse and it is uniform. Therefore, using this, okay, therefore using this, You can calculate the rotational yeah, 
Using this, you can calculate the bond distance parameter. Since 2 b is about 3.8 centimeter inverse, b itself is 1.92118 centimeter inverse and the mass of the carbon atom and the mass of the oxygen atom are known. Therefore, the moment of inertia can be calculated using the uh, uh, mu r square. It, it can be obtained from the experiment from h by 8 pi square c times b and once you know the moment of inertia from the experiment where b is known and h and c are fundamental constants, you can calculate using the mu the uh, carbon monoxide bond distance as 1.131 angstrom. So, such as I have said in this uh, lecture notes, similar uh, calculations can be done for other diatomic molecule and very, very accurate values for the bond distances and the dipole moments and other properties of diatomic molecules are given in well known textbooks and uh, monographs and the most famous among them is the monograph by Professor Hertzberg and Huber on the molecular constants of the diatomic molecules. Therefore, lots of information is available on spectra. Intensities of diatomic spectral lines, rotational lines A little bit about the wave function here. When we write h psi is equal to e psi and this is the rotational Hamiltonian that we have solved, psi happens to be a wave function with an angular momentum quantum number j and uh, it has another quantum number, the projection of the angular momentum on the chosen molecular axis direction k. And the value of k is between 0, plus minus 1, plus minus 2 up to plus minus j. So, there are 2 j plus 1 energy levels for any given j, for any j. In the absence of an external field, all these energy levels are degenerate. They have the same energy, but there are 2 j plus 1 uh, independent energy levels. And therefore, when you talk about the intensity, the intensity is roughly proportional to the number of molecules in any given energy level j, which undergo transition to either j plus 1 or j minus 1 through absorption or emission. And m j is proportional to the degeneracy which we write as nu j times an ex the Boltzmann factor exponential minus the rotational energy divided by the thermal factor namely k b t. Therefore, at any given temperature t with the Boltzmann constant k b, the rotational energy of the molecule and the degeneracy of the molecule determines roughly the number of the molecules in that energy level. And in this case, of course, Ej's are extremely small. Compared to Kbt, at any temperature like a few kelvins to room temperature and so on. As T increases, of course, this ratio, this Ej by Kbt becomes even smaller. And if this is extremely small, what it means is that the ratio of the molecules in a given energy level, which we will write it as double prime for a lower energy level, j double prime by n j prime upper energy level that the molecule undergoes transition to, write it as j prime. This ratio is given by n j double prime by n j prime is given by nu j double prime, the degeneracy at the lower energy level divided by the, new, the degeneracy at the higher energy level nu j times exponential minus E j double prime minus E j prime by k b t. And you know E j double prime is going to be roughly 
is going to be exactly B J H C and in our notation this is H C B into J into J plus 1. Okay. Therefore, the population distribution between an energy level J double prime and another energy level J prime in the ratio of that population is given in terms of the new degeneracy factor as well as the Boltzmann factor which is thermal distribution. Assuming this means that we assume thermal equilibrium and the radiation equilibrium between the electromagnetic radiation and the system in any given temperature. This ratio determines the intensity distribution of transitions between a given energy level to the next energy level. So, if you look at the spectrum of carbon monoxide in the lecture notes I have given, you can see that clearly. This is the spectrum of uh, hydrogen fluoride, we will come back to it. Let us look at the carbon monoxide spectrum. You can see that the intensity for uh, the lower J values to higher J values actually undergoes the intensity increases. Please remember this is absorption. Therefore, the steeper the, uh, the longer this is the more the absorption and so you can see that the intensity follows a profile absorption profile and there is uh, it is not the highest for the lowest energy it is actually highest for some intermediate values of J. This is very very characteristics of characteristic of microwave spectroscopy. In the next segment, we will see what this is due to and have a small, uh, have an elementary formula to tell you where the maximum will happen. This does not happen with vibrational spectrum for example, because in the case of vibrational spectroscopy in the harmonic oscillator approximation, the energy difference between two harmonic vibrational levels is much greater than the thermal KBT unit of energy and therefore, most of the molecules for a reasonably uh, stable diatomic or triatomic molecule, most of the molecules are in the vibrationally V is equal to 0 state. Therefore, the spectral intensities are such that the 0 to 1 transition in the case of a vibration spectrum is the strongest. On the other hand, with the microwave spectrum, it is not the J is equal to 0 to 1 that is the strongest. In fact, J is equal to 0 to 1 is weaker than J is equal to 1 to 2. There is a point at which the intensity is maximum and that J can also be approximately determined. We will do all these things in the next segment on the microwave uh, spectrum of the diatomic and polyatomic molecule. So, in summary, what we need to know recall is this relation for this class, the rotational constants E j, the pure diatomic molecular spectrum, the energy levels are given by the Planck's constant square divided by 8 pi square i into a, and a quantum number j such that it is j into j plus 1 and the consequence of that is that bond distances can be determined. We will continue this lecture in the next segment where we look at a little bit about the diatomic molecule both the rigid case and the non-rigid case and say briefly some things about the polyatomic molecule, limit ourselves to only what are known as the symmetric top molecules and that would be the part of this course. Until then, thank you very much.